The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples were, had met, were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. <laughs> Since I've been spending a little extra time with the Ten Commandments in preparation for ACE today, I read this story about Thomas and the disciples and the second and third resurrection appearances after Jesus' death and after the first Easter. And I'd almost like to add an eleventh commandment to our list of ten. Thou shall not covet your neighbor's faith. Thou shall not covet your neighbor's faith. This is what I mean by that. We have a wonderful ecumenical blend here in our community at St. John's. We have some who have been what I have heard called cradle Lutherans, Lutherans since our very earliest days. We have some who grew up in other faith traditions Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopalian, so on and so forth. And we have people who have come to us through marrying a Christian person. <laughs> we have all sorts of faith backgrounds here in this community. I am a cradle Lutheran. I grew up going to an ELCA Lutheran church one block away from my house, so close that we walked to church every day and only drove when we had a grandparent with us for whom a one block walk was too far. So, not unlike a lot of other young adults, when I went off to college and was away from my church home and out of my routine of attending worship weekly at my ELCA Lutheran Church, I was presented for perhaps the very first time in a very magnanimous way, a variety of different faith expressions than my own. Not an uncommon experience, right? But it really struck me the particular passionate and charismatic expression of my peers who grew up in charismatic, non-denominational churches who, while we like to keep our hands down and by our sides, right, they like to raise their hands in praise of the Lord during worship, which is totally allowed here as well. Most of us just choose not to participate in that, right? But the charismatic faith of my non-denominational and Baptist-leading friends often hinged on the idea that one should have a personal 
huge turn of events uh, conversion experience that is so dynamic and powerful in your life that one would then commit to following Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and accept them into your heart. Have you heard this language before? We don't often talk about that as Lutheran people because we know that Jesus chose us long before we could choose him. <laughs> and thanks be to God that Jesus chooses us and is not waiting for us to make any kind of choice back. Thanks be to God, this is grace. But when confronted with my peers who had deeply passionate, charismatic faith, I started to wonder, had some measures of jealousy and curiosity, and started to doubt, probably for the first time, if my forever and ever Lutheran, born and raised, always present, given faith, was adequate. If because I, unlike my peers, had not had a huge change of life conversion experience, one particular momentous event that made all the difference, that because I hadn't had one of those, like these friends professed to have had, if my faith was somehow lacking, not enough, insufficient, or perhaps that because I hadn't had one of those experiences, if God was somehow less oriented to me, or less close to me, or less at work in my life. Today, we hear Thomas go through a similar flavor of experience. If we catch this story closely, we hear that in the second resurrection experience, when Jesus appeared to all the other disciples in a locked home, Thomas was not there. We don't know why. Thomas might have been busy caring for the sick or preaching the word or visiting his mother. Who knows? Thomas might have been doing something very purposeful. But either way, he wasn't there. It gives me the sort of feeling like when someone you love comes home and says to you, oh my gosh, you'd never, met, you'd never believe who I saw today. It was so-and-so. I haven't seen them in years. And oh, it was so good to catch up with them. <sighs> but you missed out because you weren't there. And you wish that you would have seen that person that you love so well who was just absent from your presence. Thomas missed out. He did not get to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the risen living Christ that all the other disciples got to have. Thomas missed out that day on more than just another opportunity to see Jesus, to listen to him speak, to be encouraged by his words and strengthened in faith. Thomas missed out on what would have been for the others an opportunity to receive face-to-face -to -face direct proof that Jesus was in fact alive, that his resurrection was not a rumor or a hoax or just some delusional dream that others had hoped would be true. Thomas missed out on getting to have a direct personal encounter with the risen and living Christ himself. So later when Thomas responds with his words, I will not believe unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and the wound in his side. I understand Thomas. And I don't think that what Thomas was expressing with those words was skepticism or disbelief. I think that what Thomas was saying is that he just wanted the same experience that everyone else had. That Thomas had missed out on a direct resurrection encounter himself and he wanted one of those. Is that too much to ask for? To get to have our own experience of Jesus Christ and to be strengthened in faith for ourselves rather than just taking everyone else's word for it? The good news for today is found in how Jesus responds to Thomas. Jesus does not respond by keeping his distance or putting him down or making him feel like he was less than or that his faith was less than because he had this admission. 
Jesus instead goes to Thomas back in the house one week later where all the disciples were gathered, but this time Thomas was there. And Jesus goes right for Thomas. Jesus gives Thomas exactly the thing that he asked for and says that he needs in order to believe. The good news is that Jesus wants to meet our needs for connection and faith so that believing is not held on by a thread, but that believing is deep and embedded in our lives for Thomas and for us. Jesus seeks to meet our need so that we can believe and have life in his name. Because until Thomas got to see the marks of the nails that held Jesus to the cross and the gaping wound that which they pierced him with a sword to let blood out of his body as he was dying, Thomas was trapped in the bands of death. Thomas wanted to be free so that he could move forward in resurrection life with all the rest of the disciples and all those who believed that Jesus Christ is actually the Messiah. The story is good news for us because it means that like Thomas, for each and every one of you, you have something that you need for faith. You have perhaps an unmet area in your life or in your faith that you need Jesus to come alongside, care for you, and strengthen you so that you can believe and have life in his name and also be not trapped in death. And that Jesus seeks to meet those needs, not in a one-size-fits-all kind of way, as though each of us needs the same thing, and poof, we will have the perfect faith. Jesus meets our individual personal needs so that we can be strengthened. Change the story about Thomas. Just humor me for a minute. After they had met and Thomas was missing and Jesus appeared and he showed them and we have seen the Lord, they say, what if Jesus went back the second time? And instead of going to Thomas and showing him his hands and his side, the thing that he'd asked for the same as everyone else, what if Thomas went over to, say, Simon Peter, I don't know, and showed him the mark of his hands and the wound in his side? I imagine Simon Peter might say something like, well, yeah, Jesus, I saw it last week when you were here before. I know, I've seen you already. Thank you very much, but I'm good. I'm set, I believe. That's not what Simon Peter would need. It's what Thomas needs. And so in the same way, Jesus comes alongside us to give you, to give each of us what we need so that we can be strengthened in faith. So perhaps, are you anxious? Jesus gives you peace. Peace be with you, Jesus says. Are you desperate? Jesus gives you hope. Are you deeply stuck in fear for any reason? Jesus gives you comfort and strength. Are you sick or in need of a miraculous healing? Jesus brings you deep restoration in body, mind, and spirit. Jesus brings to each and every one what it is that we need so that we can have life in his name. Faith, though we are united in it, all of us together as one body in Christ, as a church and across denominations, is not a cookie-cutter experience. Though we have much in common, we are also strengthened and can rejoice that when we see the Lord, it is for us. It is to give you the area of gaping wound and need and loss in your life so that you can find peace and joy and strength in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So then the good news is not another commandment. The good news then is, that, is not, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's faith. The good news for us is that we don't need to. Because our neighbor's faith, who is different from us, the one that looks shiny and appealing on the outside, is not the faith that you need. How tempting is it for us to look down the pew and feel our suffering on the inside that we may or may not be sharing with our neighbors yet 
and look at someone else and say, wow, their faith is so strong and so assured. I wish I had their faith. They might be wishing the same thing about yours. What if instead of always playing the comparison game to our neighbor, whose faith looks great from the outside, and maybe it truly is, and let's hope that for each other, what if we take courage in knowing that Jesus meets what we need in faith? That the faith that God has blessed you with in the power of the resurrection is the one for you, is the one that meets your need, not your neighbor's, is the one that strengthens the particular challenges that you are facing in your life rather than the ones your neighbor is facing. We give thanks that Jesus knows us and loves us intimately and well so that his love is for you and for all of us, but comes into our lives to strengthen the need that we have so that we may not be stuck in the bonds of death, but may be set free by the power of the resurrection to truly have life in Jesus' name. I love the way that the story ends. It says that these things are written in this book, but there are more (laughs) that we do not get the privilege to have. I am so curious about the other things that Jesus did to strengthen the faith of his followers. But there's already a variety in here. There are healing stories, teaching stories, caring stories, resurrection stories, because each of us needs something different. What are you longing for in faith today? Where would your faith be strengthened so that you may believe in the power of Jesus' resurrection for the whole world and just for you? May you find peace. As Jesus says, peace be with you in these words and in the faith of Thomas today. Amen.